Hey Sopranos fans, welcome to another episode here on Bully Whispers, and we are here today to discuss Law 11 of Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power, Learn to Keep People Dependent on You, in the TV show The Sopranos. Now before digging in, it's important to note a couple things. First, many viewers may infer that keeping them dependent implies that you are independent, but this is not at all the case. Green states that a completely independent man would live in a cabin in the woods. He would have total freedom to come and go as he pleased, but he would have no power. Don't make me pull rank on you, kid. Fuck you, Paulie. Captain or no captain, right now we're just two assholes lost in the woods. Power inherently involves relationships between people, and you will always need allies, pawns, and weak masters to serve as a front. Second, despite the fact that Tony's handling of Junior fit perfectly into the dynamic of power that Green describes, in this chapter he advocates being a powerful right-hand man rather than being the boss, which offers all of the perks of power without any of the thorns that come with being on top. All due respect, you got no fucking idea what it's like to be number one. For that reason, Syl will come into play much more than Tony today, and in looking into him, we will discover his secret weapon, so to speak. However, in order to fully explore all the different aspects of Law 11, other characters will come into play. So in this episode, we will evaluate Power Law 11 by first taking a second to address how the base principles and historical examples given for this law form the basis of power for the mob in general, before moving on to the difference between intensive and extensive power, as demonstrated through Hesh, followed by comparing Syl as a number two with Henry Kissinger, and ending with the character who seems to be the exception for many of the points made in this law. King Louis XI loved astrology so much that he kept an astrologer in his court who predicted that a lady of the court would die within eight days, and one did. This terrified King Louis, who now wanted the astrologer killed, because either A, he did it himself to make his prediction come true, or B, he actually was that powerful, which made him a threat. When the day came, King Louis called the astrologer up to his room, where he was going to be pushed out of a window, but King Louis couldn't help but ask one last question. He asked the astrologer when he thought he himself would die, to which the astrologer replied, Three days before you, your majesty. Not only was the astrologer not killed, but King Louis kept him around and lavished him with gifts from then until his death, which, by the way, was before the astrologers, so the prediction wasn't accurate, but it did save his life by attaching the king's life to it. This is an indirect dependence. King Louis wasn't dependent on the astrologer in the traditional sense, for food, money, etc. He was dependent on nothing happening to the astrologer because if it did, the same would happen to him, which is basically the same dynamic present in mob interactions. Better not do anything to me, or the same will happen to you. This is an example of extensive power, which is power based on the people you know or the systems that you are a part of, as well as an example of the interdependent nature of extensive power because you are ultimately reliant on them to back you up. Intensive power, on the other hand, is based on something you can do that no one else can, and in order for that to be your primary source of power, you pretty much have to be a savant. Just being very good might not be enough. In 1442, the Count of Carmagnola, a brave and storied mercenary, was called to Venice supposedly to be honored, but instead was thrown in the dungeon and killed the next day on trumped-up charges. Despite all he had done, he had begun acting independently, so he suffered the same fate as many of the great mercenaries in Renaissance Italy, all because they didn't understand how replaceable they were. No matter how good they were, there was always someone younger, cheaper, more cooperative, and less threatening to take their place. Michelangelo, on the other hand, was able to get away with things that no other artist could, even having Pope Julius II begging him to stay at one point, because he was a savant. There was no getting another Michelangelo. No one else could do what he did, which brings us to Hesh. Now let me start off by saying I am not claiming Hesh is a Michelangelo-level talent. I am saying that, like Michelangelo, Hesh's power is primarily intensive because he can do things that none of the rest of them can. The first thing that may come to mind is his ability to make a lot of money on his own without relying on getting good rackets like Ralphie or Vito with construction. But remember, Hesh was never taxed until Junior became boss, and even still, that's the kind of thing that's actually likely to make the people above you more uncomfortable since you are no longer as dependent upon them. Just ask Michael Francis. The reason Hesh was able to make that much money for that long of a time period without paying a tax like everyone else is because compared to everyone else he had Solomon-like wisdom, gave great advice, and in that capacity he was irreplaceable. 
After all, which of the older generation of Jersey gangsters that we know of was capable of filling Hesh's shoes? Junior? No. Bobby Bacala Sr.? No. Feech Lamana? No. Holly Walnuts? Hell no. None of them are even remotely capable of doing what Hesh did, whereas any number of gangsters could have filled in for them without missing a beat, just like the mercenaries of Renaissance Italy. This is why acquiring intensive power is generally more difficult, because while practice and study may improve your abilities, when you get to the highest levels, it almost has to be in your blood. I could have spent my whole life practicing painting day and night, and I still wouldn't even be close to Michelangelo. When it comes to extensive power, while natural ability certainly plays a part, effort and persistence play a much bigger role than an intensive power. Henry Kissinger survived many bloodlettings during the Nixon administration, not because he was the best diplomat, there were plenty who were better, not because he got along well with Nixon, they certainly didn't, and not even because they were ideologically aligned, they weren't. He survived because he had made himself so entrenched in so many aspects of the administration that it would be too much of a problem to get rid of him, which didn't seem to be the case for one Silvio Manfred Dante. According to Green, if you do not have that necessity about you in some way, you will be replaced at the first opportunity, and Sill doesn't have the level of extensive power that it may seem like he does at first glance. Sure, he has his own connections and sources that he won't say by name in front of the others, instead saying something like, my guy over in the whatever department, but so does almost every other Jersey gangster at some point in the series, so that is neither new nor unique. Accordingly, Tony was considering moving Chris up to his right-hand man well before Chris was ready, despite knowing Chris's drug history, and all because Chris might possess a level of loyalty that none of the others would. Now, whether or not Tony was right in that regard is irrelevant in this conversation. That being said, even if he was right, had he actually moved Christopher up to the number two spot, he would have found out that Sill's true value was intensive and that Chris would never be able to match it no matter how much practice he got nor connections he made. You see, Tony's personality can be very abrasive, and unless he's talking to someone very high up like Carmine Sr., he tends to be someone who escalates tensions rather than eases them. Unfortunately, so is Chris. Now, to be fair, Chris does usually make up with people much quicker than Tony, but in the moment, he almost always escalates tension, and the combination of these two at the top could lead to some serious dysentery among the ranks. Sill's power was intensive, and his secret weapon lie in his ability to ease tensions. In that capacity, none of the others could match him. The only two who may have the personality to do it would be Patsy Parisi and Bobby Bacala, but both of them, especially Bobby, seem a bit too meek for the role. Almost inevitably, and probably very quickly, Sill would find himself back in the number two spot because no one else even had the potential to counterbalance Tony like he did. Sill was irreplaceable in the function that he served, and his personality was perfectly suited for the role of powerful advisor as Green describes it. He had a level of authority and privilege that was second only to Tony's, and he didn't have to deal with the thorns that Green says comes along with being on top, which we know he didn't want from when Tony was in the coma. Lastly, I will leave you with the one character who violates almost every aspect of this law, yet comes out clean in the end, Polly Walnuts. He wasn't a big earner. He didn't do anything that nobody else could do. No one other than his nephew was particularly dependent on him. He irritated everyone, and by the end, Tony knew he had talked to New York, so his loyalty was even in question. Yet, he was never replaced. Maybe his intensive power was simply being a survivor. After a nuclear holocaust, it would just be Polly Walnuts and the cockroaches hanging out. Well, thanks again for watching this episode here on Bully Whispers. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.